Okay, I will uh, start my presentation. So uh, I'm Peter, uh, and uh, I come from uh, Aalborg University. I'm located here in uh, in Copenhagen, actually, um, in the old uh, Nokia facilities. I think Marcus has probably been down there making some interviews back in the day. Um, so I'm sitting in this building, <laughs> and uh, I've been looking at in my PhD. I've been looking at R&D offshoring, uh, particularly to China and somewhat India as well. Uh, so now I'll sort of extract from that uh, some key findings as I, as I see them and I'll talk about the, this process as it unfolds as I've uh, witnessed it in these companies I've been looking at. And then I'll try to make it a little bit oriented towards the policy things even though my usual sphere is more sort of the microeconomic looking from, from the firm perspective at things. But uh, that may not be too relevant for you. But um, so here goes. I structured it quite simply. A little bit of introduction and some challenges, opportunities, and recommendations. So if we look at international R&D management, uh, as we've heard already, a lot of things are going on. And uh, even though it's mostly the big multinational companies that are offshoring R&D, uh, there's also evidence that actually a lot of small companies are doing the same. Maybe they are not using always the captive form where they are owning the R&D facilities themselves, but, uh, but there's actually a lot of uh, R&D offshoring even among companies that are below 50 employees, etc. We know that there's a lot of things ha happened in China and India. These statistics may not be uh, completely correct, but at least it shows some evidence that uh, a lot of foreign multinationals have established themselves with R&D in China and India particularly. Uh, if we look at sort of the, is there a brick in uh, global R&D? Um, yeah, well, mostly it's India and China, as we already heard. So the old triad of, oh, of, uh, of US, Europe and Japan has been um, complemented with India and China. And Brazil is, well, there's not so much activity yet, and Russia uh, is also sort of only starting to pick up, you could say. But we also see, for instance, Huawei from China is doing some uh, work on um, some of their uh, math, heavy math uh, development, you could say, in, uh, in Russia. And this is some work uh, that's done. The GLORAD is an organization led by Max von Sedbert and other people uh, that are very active in this field. So you can have more information there, if you like. So, I've been looking at mostly uh, what are, how do you develop an R&D site, how do you make it able to carry out its mandate uh, in a foreign location like China and India. And if we look at what are the usual suspects, why would you go abroad, uh, what, what kind of mandate would you, would you give to such a facility if you move to China or a European company. Then it's more, you could say, the bottom things like upstream support, so if you have already manufacturing in place, uh, you want to help them, you could say. It calls for, for knowledge in terms of uh, helping how to develop our manufacturing processes, etc. It could be in terms of uh, specifying to the local sourcing market if you source heavily in a, in a low-cost location. But then over time we often see that the, the mandate changes a little bit from this upstream focus to having, because you, you may uh, identify some local uh, market opportunities as well, and then uh, the, the focus changes to, to reaping uh, or benefiting from these opportunities. So it becomes more of a downstream support, you could say, adapting existing products or developing new products that are specifically focused for the local market demands. And then only after a while you'll probably see that, that the focus could change yet again to, to something which is more uh, of a knowledge-seeking character where you're developing something which is uniquely new for, for the world, you could say, and not only looking at this market. What I've been looking at is primarily uh, case studies, in particular these companies. I've also looked at other companies, but uh, this is my PhD project, um, different industries. Um, yeah, so it's mostly anecdotal. <laughs> um, my work uh, in this area is, uh, you could say, it's sort of distributed along uh, the offshoring process as it unfolds. So. So from you start uh, looking into where, where to locate and uh, how do you then train people, how do you uh, start working and how do you engage the local environment and 
and try to um, get to a stage where you're also feeding something back to your R&D headquarters in Europe, for instance. So in the beginning, you can look at how can we acquire some knowledge. Uh, so I've looked into what are, what are differences between offshoring R&D and other types of functions. So usually R&D is uh, the latest function that we would offshore. Uh, knowledge characteristics are different. So that's something I've been looked into in those uh, papers. Then I looked at uh, local uh, talent utilization. So how are how is R&D differently conducted in these places, and what are implications in terms of performance outcomes, etc.? Um, how can we try to to work with this in a in a sense making way so as to complement uh, R&D work done in Europe and done in China, for instance? Um, then I looked at how we engage the local environment. You can say what are barriers when you interact locally. Uh, what are ways of networking, <laughs> um, and how do you uh, collaborate with, with local manufacturing, sourcing, uh, market, and universities. And lastly, I've looked at uh, more focusing on uh, antecedents and uh, how we, we nurture reverse innovation or reverse knowledge transfer. For me, it's a bit the same. <laughs> uh, so the notion is that instead of looking at uh, the usual uh, flow of innovation from the US and then to, to other lesser developed markets uh, that you would see a reverse flow so that the um, products are ideated, developed, and initially introduced in a developing country and then afterwards in a developed market. So I'm not going all through all this. I'll just have some, uh, some, some pinpoints, some, some, some drop down in some, in some of the material uh, in accordance to what I might think is most relevant for you. <laughs> So this is another way to divide the, the transfer process if you want to set up an RD unit. You could say um, we can have a look at what our, our experiences, our ability to, to transfer and, and set up such a facility elsewhere. How easily could it be possible to, um, to share our knowledge and uh, thereby develop a capability in a new location? How can we develop the people and their capacity to learn locally? And how can we engage the local environment so as to take advantage of the new uh, collaboration opportunities that may be available in that this location and that will usually be a way you can find there's something which is more distinctive in terms of the uh, capability you can develop in this uh, unit so looking at challenges of course you probably know a little bit about if we say china you know something about confucius maybe and and uh, so it's often been mentioned that if we want to do R&D in China, one in invitation could be this legacy of respect for and focus on existing knowledge as opposed to creating new. And this is, of course, something from the past. I'm just mentioning it because, well, it's part of the cultural background. Uh, so it's something you somehow need to deal with. Um, school systems have quite a bit of focus on root learning, um, partially because the language is as it is. You need to learn a lot of science. The flip side can be that if you have people that are good at memorizing, this is also something that's very important for learning the basics of tech skills, you could say. So there's a flip side to this as well. Um, if we look more particularly at institutional, um, the institutional background, how it influences R&D work in the location, you could say that if we compare Scandinavia and uh, China, China is a place where there's uh, more of the power distance, uh, Hofstede would probably call it, um, the, the relationship to your boss is very important. So it can be a little bit difficult to navigate in a foreign multinational company with a, a matrix organization where you have a project leader and a line manager and you need to sort of navigate both of them. And then if you find one day you show up at work and both of them have left at this, within a short time, it, it can be a little bit difficult to know who should I have a, a close connection to. Um, so that could trigger some... Uh, some people leaving the company. Um, but more to the point, if we look at R&D work, you could say in Scandinavia, people are, uh, an advantage could be sometimes that we, we don't care so much about what our managers think. So if we're told to, to go in one direction, we might change our mind because depending on uh, the results as they unfold. So we may be more, uh, have a higher propensity to, um, you could say, improvise and, and do a little bit our own thing. Um, so the Chinese, you could say, uh, propensity to, to listen carefully to what the boss says could sometimes 
leave people, R&D engineers in, in China in a bit of a dilemma. Should I surface something, which is a problem I've, I've come across, or should I continue working in the direction I've been told to? So from foreign multinational companies, uh, it can be a good idea to, to follow R&D projects closely so as to surface uh, both good ideas and problems that you run into faster. So it's a simple uh, suggestion. Talking again about uh, other challenges, it's, it's quite easy to not realize the problems that you face when you do R&D in, in a place like China. So the sourcing market is different, standards are different if they exist. Uh, quality, um, the, 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 the way of approaching quality and, it, and reassuring that you have good quality in your components and your products is different. Um, and usually it could be a good idea if you put in place a quality uh, program, it's often something which is quickly implemented. But you also need to follow up and ensure that people keep following these instructions. Um, so um, it's, there's, there's a lot of complexity in, in sort of working in a new supply environment uh, and it has implications for manufacturing, it has implications for R&D and for the interaction between R&D and manufacturing. Then we could have a look at opportunities and uh, one good thing in China certainly is that the, there are a lot of investments in, in R&D and the government is quite eager to, to invest in, in technology. There's been some <coughs> notions of technology bargaining as well that, that foreign companies get access to the market but then you could say there's a trade-off. They also need to, to provide some more technology for the market and, for, and doing some R&D uh, in China. Um, it's a lot easier to develop a product for a market if you're present there. You are more likely to pick up the trends and demands as they unfold and you're more dynamic in that, in that aspect. As has already been mentioned today, there are a lot of smart and eager people and there's a lot of tech preference, so it's easier to find uh, PhDs within certain technical areas in China than it may be elsewhere. And we also, of course, these numbers are a little bit uh, insecure. Statistics can be massaged in different ways. And uh, I'm not only blaming China for massaging R&D spending, it's very... Uh, dominant in Denmark as well. I, I heard a case of a certain university that had to pay a, be off above the market rent uh, in rent for, to the state and that's a way to d saying okay that now we're spending money on R&D but actually we're not. <laughs> um, so I think um, recently I, in my own aim I put a little thing in the, the Jutland post because it, it seems strange that we're cutting back on research and, and technical development because why, sh why would we do that? Um, <laughs> so I think there's a little bit of a contrast with uh, is China now the ones we should uh, look up to and try to, to uh, get inspiration from. And I think in, in many ways we should because there's a, an immense uh, entrepreneurial uh, spirit and an immense uh, willingness to invest in, in tech. So I think that's, that's something we can learn from. So if we look at and try to compare R&D, what is it like in Scandinavia versus China, you could say that uh, for if you take a Chinese engineer to, to Scandinavia, uh, what they'll say about what's going on here it could often be something like, when do you guys ever get anything done? I mean, you're just having coffee and eating cake, etc. Um, so the, it can be a little bit peculiar to see that we spend so much time on talking uh, together, not being so efficient and focused. Um, there's a little bit more of a, you could say, Scandinavian approach of trying out, maybe starting three to five different experiments and I'm running them in parallel. And then I'm going a little bit in that direction that I want to go in. You know, if this one seems, seems to be interesting, then I'll focus on that one and the other ones I'm leaving a little bit aside. And the Chinese are more likely to start with one experiment and be very thorough and continue and seeing it through. Uh, so there are examples where where some data have been sent from Scandinavia where, okay, we've been looking at it, we didn't find anything interesting, and then the Chinese had a look at it and, and were able to optimize the process, etc. Um, so there are some, you could say, benefits to both approaches, but the Scandinavian approach may be better in terms of surfacing problems in the R&D projects earlier or new ideas, because we talk together so we share the ideas faster maybe. Uh, on the other hand, there may be a little bit of lack of being thorough enough and, and uh, you know, doing the, 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 
experiments to the end. So there are complementarities that we can uh, take advantage of when we internationalize our R&D into China as well. So. Yes, and then uh, there's also the opportunity, of course, to have more diverse innovation flows. And this is a map of uh, reverse innovation types. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, reverse innovation. And with some colleagues, uh, I've been involved in, in the paper where we look at how can we map out innovation flows globally, looking at uh, the boundaries between developed and developing countries. And we have this four-phase model that you can look at. And then we basically just make introduce some distinctions between uh, reverse innovations um, in a strong sense and reverse innovations in a weak sense. Uh, and then we also have some other global innovation flows. So that, that's a way you can map out uh, your R&D uh, network to some extent. Um, in terms of recommendations, I could say that um, if you want to set up R&D or have set up R&D, uh, I think it's in order to nurture the capability focus and build up in a new site, it can be relevant not to give them too much decision power from the beginning. Um, maybe force them to ask in the headquarter first if there's some certain capabilities in place that we can learn from instead of trying to reinvent everything anew. Uh, so it could be relevant to, to uh, give not too much decision power locally in the beginning, but as uh, an R&D site maturates, it can be relevant to give more power so they, they can also uh, decide for themselves who to collaborate with locally and thereby they're more efficient in, in uh, exploring those opportunities and taking advantage of them because that could often be what will uh, later be flowing back to the headquarters in terms of new capabilities for the organization. So, Finally, or it's one of the last slides, but I'm, I'm looking, if I should say what, what would I recommend to others doing this, uh, it would be to clarify the role. I think Marcus have also found that often offshoring activities are not done in a way where it's a clear goal and we know why we're doing it. <laughs> um, so uh, that can save a lot of time. Um, it's often very good to have, say, like, if you want to motivate Chinese employees and make them stay over a longer time, if you can make it relevant, you know, your R&D work relevant, particularly for China. So if you can help with, with the environmental problems, etc., uh, that can be a, a good motivator. I would recommend to involve local management early and gradually delegate more and more uh, decision power to the site, but ensure that there is a clear link with the rest of the global R&D network. Um, there are many sites that are set up which are, you could say, just given their own life, but then it's difficult to sustain or find uh, a reason why, wh what is ours and etc. Um, then I would also recommend to supervise R&D projects very closely. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, then you're more likely to pick up on uh, problems and new ideas that you would not otherwise be aware of. From, in terms of what should EU do, uh, looking from our perspective, I'll, I'll attempt some policy-oriented uh, um, recommendations. And I think it's quite important that we keep some manufacturing. And I think there's also an increased uh, recognition of this. If we don't have manufacturing uh, in, in the EU countries, we, we lose out on capabilities that are also very important for, for making the right designs for new products in the future. Uh, so the links between manufacturing and R&D are, are still important in many industries. Um, and I think we should invest more in technical education and R&D. Uh, Denmark is not particularly uh, active in this area. Um, so that's something I see w that we need to do. <laughs> so that's more of a, work, a viewpoint, but uh, yeah. Lastly, since uh, with, the f with the, this overall project and the event in mind, we see this is a picture of, from Beijing. Uh, and it's nice to see that, at least from the central government's perspective, it seems like China is, is more active. This is from uh, engineer on, uh, a paper for engineers in Denmark, uh, pointing out that um, at least there are plans to reduce. So this is oil, and this is coal, and this is nuclear. So the sustainable energies, uh, there's a plan for, for making them take up a, a bigger share of the energy market in, in China. And then hopefully this will also be implemented in the local uh, governments. But it remains to be seen.
these are the papers if you're further interested or you can talk with me and I can provide it for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.